In today's episode, I speak to Robin Farmer about why and how mavericks are the kings of the hub networks. We also discuss the role of nurture in the development of the maverick personality. One of the things that Robin and I speak about is the secret organisation within the company and why some people are unable to feed from the hub network. These hub networks that mavericks ride with ease do not map onto the company's formal network. They are, in fact, more stable and efficient. Listen up to the rest of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the pathologically curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today our guest is Robin Farmer. How are you doing, Robin? I'm uh, I'm very well. Very well indeed. Thank you. Cool. Before we start, if you can just tell us a bit about you, that'd be great. Okay. Um, So technically I'm retired. kind of retired injured uh some years ago i was diagnosed with a blood cancer and uh it, it um it kind of took all my focus um but that's okay uh, there's been huge changes in my life but also massive benefits my ability to engage with my grandchildren of which i've got six has been a huge godsend a blessing um and I'm just able to spend more time with them and in, enjoy their company. Um, my um, background is technical um, and long, um, but the the most recent twenty odd years has been was been spent within uh, Microsoft in the UK okay. uh, in various roles from sales through to uh, people development and people people leadership. Excellent. Cool. So one of the things I'm really keen to talk to you about is this notion of yours that large corporates manufacture mavericks. What do you mean by that? Um, the, the, the dilemma, and, and there have been books written on it, and um, actually what I'm going to talk about originated in a white paper that some colleagues and I produced for Microsoft Executive, is this is this um, dilemma where anarchy is exactly what you need in a in a startup and small growing company, especially if you're disrupting in a market. Mm-hmm. But the minute that you become successful, your focus is forced onto control and governance. So the the anarchy and the behaviors that were the lifeblood of the business that got it where it's got are going to kill it in where it wants to go. Um, the usual corporate problems of money, f- stockholders, um, press, uh, need, you need more control over the business. And the way the organizations do that is they grow and enforce the governance side of the business. And what became clear was that the requirements of governance um, and of of, um, financial reporting and control Mm -hmm. directly impinged upon the degrees of freedom of the innovators. And very, very quickly, um, the innovators in organizations seem to do one of two things. Uh, they either use their intelligence and innovative skills to attack and and try and destroy the governance because they don't (laughs) like it, or they navigate around it. 
the theory created a, a very simple, um, uh, very simple bit of maths, which I, um, <laughs> it, I originally didn't, but it became called Farmer's Law. Oh. And that's a very simple, <laughs> simple equation, right? Which is G governance times I innovation equals a constant in this case one in other words the governance and innovation are directly um in, in proportion in proportionate uh in the if you have more governance you get less innovation if you have more innovation you destroy governance uh, and it's a, gotcha. it's a kind of dilemma that all big organizations suffer from and there have been books written about the innovators dilemma and things like that. Okay, let um, me just stop you there. Yeah. I can see we'll be unpacking a lot of stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting what you said because it made me think of, um, of my definitions of Mavericks. So um, mm -hmm. I've been defining Mavericks as wealthy independent since 2005. And in yep. my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders, I look at socialized mavericks and extreme yep. mavericks, which share the same kind of ability and attributes and mindset other than one is focused into the greater good and the other yep. is focused onto themselves. So yes. um, it's, it's the, the moral di dimension is what distinguishes the two of them and how they act. And it made me think, because when you said... Um, they'll either innovate to destroy, which is what the extreme mavericks tend to do, or, or they'll navigate around it, which is what the socialised mavericks do. It's kind of, it. you know, you take that and you sort of go, well, depending on the personality type is how they're going to act. Um, oh, and, and, and I think I think it's it's even more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. In the, It's also um, how they're treated. Yes. Tell me more so, about this. Yeah, um, what I saw, and I've I've managed, I, I've managed salespeople, I've managed support people, and I've managed consultants uh, and project managers within within Microsoft, and they were invariably very very smart. And the maverick, the true mavericks, um, depending on how you nurtured them, fed them, cared for them, and importantly, rewarded them. Um, you, you, if you managed them the wrong way, you would make a destructive ma maverick. That makes sense because I talk about the maverick journey and you have those extreme mavericks uh, who, depending on whether they have a compelling reason, will move towards being socialised. But yeah. the socialised maverick, if not nurtured properly, will either choose to leave or they yeah. will start to destroy, you know, they will try to, they'll try to fix and navigate. It doesn't get work. They're like, they'll either, okay, now I'll leave. Or they're like, I'll just break it then because they're bored and annoyed. Yeah. So Absolutely. They get frustrated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, they get very frustrated. And the reasons, you know, they can absolutely see that what they're doing and what they're saying is correct. Yes. And what they're faced with is, an organization in inverted commas of of people who are all doing their best and are all trying to do the right thing, but of varying degrees of um, varying degrees of willingness to sail close to the wind. Mm -hmm. um, and the Mavericks um, are typically right on the edge of the wind. The best Mavericks I ever worked with um, and the best Mavericks that managed me understood that. Yeah, you know when you talked, it came with the image of surfing, where you're on the edge uh, yes. of the wave. That's what made me think when you said that. Well, the <laughs> the reason I called my book Wave Maker was that an awful lot of what goes on in successful businesses and less successful, but an awful lot is to do with waves of energy. Mm. Be they um, initiatives, be they projects, be they products, or be they impetus created by markets. The energy is what the successful people spot and feed off of. The least successful 
get on the wrong side of the energy and try and keep something going that's got no support, no backing, no, no relevance. And what they do is burn all their energy trying to keep it alive. Yeah. But the, the mavericks and, the, and the, the career wave makers move from energy wave to energy wave, whatever it is. And, and it's, it's a personal thing. Mm. Um, it's not always the same thing that, that, um, that, fl- that, that energizes individuals. Um, or even at the so, same time. So the same thing that energizes me today might not energize me tomorrow if I've gone, yeah, I've done ah, all that. And that okay, so one of, the, one of the things that I used to talk about a lot um, was the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> <laughs> Tell well, me I, more. Well I, I, well, I used it as a kind of uh, explanation of how relevance works in organizations. And the larger the organization the more fluid the aurora of, en- of relevance is, that it's moving constantly, that it shifts from place to place, that one morning you'll be working in a part of an organization where the aurora's brought some massively relevant issue. And by the time you go home, it's moved on, flowed through the organization. And it's, if you are not smart and not realized and don't realize what's going on, you carry on investing in this in the relevance that's moved on. Could you say um, that's interesting? But could you say that the maverick is the aorta sometimes? Well, I think they're. Uh, mm, I think they're more very very attuned to spotting it. Uh huh. Um, okay. It's their their um, ability to pick up on it uh, is is innate. Where other folks and, and I'll put me in the other folks because I've missed it on a number of occasions <laughs> are head down you know grinding away at what they're doing and they miss it completely um, and every and then you'll see one of the mavericks that works alongside you or with you move off and, on, and, and people around are going what, what on earth are they doing and it's not because they've done something crazy it's because you didn't spot what they saw or yeah. what they heard that so so the way they're connected, the people they're connected to, the kind of feedback they're getting from the organization is giving them better understanding of these en- waves of relevance energy moving through the organization. You know what's interesting about that, I really like that, is that I talk about socialized mavericks being um, having large engaged networks. So. Mm. And they're in different, and they're not based like an extreme maverick in what can you give me? It's just ah. what's relevant. <laughs> so, you know, what I mean? so like well, extreme mavericks are like, it, you know, when you no longer have utility for me, you're gone. Whereas socialized yeah. mavericks never drop someone unless it's uh, due to something like they go against their principles or there was a Absolutely huge right. character flaw. But, you know, so, so the thing is, is like, so, you know, say typical office, it's just the, um, the socialized maverick will, will know the, the janitor, they'll know the receptionist, they'll know, you know, so like, so that if someone like the MD is having a board meeting and the PA is taking notes, they'll know the PA may say something in confidence, say, to the maverick who knows that finance is concerned about this and sales hasn't done this. And then okay. they'll say all the connections and go, ah, oh, in next month we're going to be moving into this market or we're going to do this. And then, then they move towards that, as you're right. Um, but other people, because there's so many people that, only have networks as large as the utility of that network. Ah, so uh, <laughs> um, it, absolutely right. Uh, in in my book Waymaker, the, there's a whole chapter on things. I'm going to have to download your book, aren't I? I'm going to have to write it down now. <laughs> Darling, I'll send you a copy. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll send you a copy. Um, but chapter three is all about something called hub networks. And the fascinating thing is that a lot of a lot of people totally get that there's a secret organization in their company Mm -hmm. that they totally get that it exists. What they don't realize is a that there is a secret organization in their in their company and that it is completely in plain sight. And the behaviors of that organization is exactly the same or that network is exactly the same behavior that they exhibit to their own local network. 
the, the behavior is identical. Um, it, it, it's a hub and spoke structure, but there are individuals within it who are hyper connected mm -hmm. and are um, socialized mavericks in that they recognize that that connectivity is what gives them their lifeblood. Yes. It's, <laughs> that is so, so it, I wrote in my book that socialized mavericks because they're very much about empowering leaders and, you know, not taking credit, even though they should, you know, because it's my team on this. <clears> and <throat> what happens is they're so interconnected that they're, as you say, they're at that wave front of new information and, you know, oh, I can just speak to so-and-so and I've cut three months worth, you know, of bureaucracy out. But the thing is, is then that the, the people that are in charge misunderstand that socialized maverick. Oh, and yeah. they begin to think that that maverick is not really required anymore because now things are running smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> so then they take out that maverick. So which tends to be they've made them disengaged by taking away power and autonomy and all this kind That's of it. stuff. Yeah. And then um, then that person's left. And in the end, they go, they'll either destroy or leave. Socialized maverick will tend to leave. And then for maybe from up to three months, things still seem normal because they put into place processes. That's it. Yeah. But <laughs> come three months, and they longer than two months, it starts to crash down because suddenly yep. they found that they can't just go to finance and get that, that thing signed off because there's no relationship there anymore. That's it. You know, so now everything you, now I will, I, I, I will send you a copy of my book and it, all, <laughs> it will all will be revealed. The the what I what I wrote about what you've done is written it from a macro level, and what I've done is tried to focus on what's actually going on, like the not not the quantum level, but the 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 atomic level of what's happening, why it's happening, and who's doing what. Now the really fascinating thing about this network of um, of influencers um, that are busy networking totally out of um, the structure of the organization, by the way. Their hub networks don't map on to the structure of the organization. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that is their networks are far more stable than the organization itself. Uh, yeah, that's so true. They, they, they carry on building these networks and structures and feeding them and energizing them, um, but they don't map typically onto the structure of the organization because the organization has changed too often. And it's mapped onto the real influencers, whether that's the PA to the MD or yep. the one that, you know, cleans the toilets. It doesn't, you know, it's also, I think maybe it's because the socialized member is not looking at utility, they're looking at interest level and, and they actually care. So, so the network, which ends up being extremely large, isn't a dead network because they genuinely care if that person's okay or what's going on. And if they ask them what they did for the weekend, they're doing it, but not because they've been told to do it, but they want to know. <laughs> they really care. Well, you've touched on two things there. One is that the currency and the electricity that's flowing in these hub networks is something called reciprocity. Mm -hmm in that you, if you get how this works and you behave like a socialized individual, you get that you pay it forward. You mm -hmm. don't always get back what you paid forward. But the more you're paying into that network with reciprocity, with information, which is really what's being reciprocated, that information singles you out as a as a valuable hub and other hubs seek you out if mm. you if you simply leech off the network and don't reciprocate and don't feed it this utilitarian idea it, the network will freeze you out eventually because others will recognize you don't reciprocate or if you do, it's because there's utility. You perceive there's some sort of utility. So, like, yes. you know, because some people, some like the like, like extreme maverick is extremely charming, and for a while, oh, yeah. you feel like you're the best person. You know, the minute they looked at you, you're Absolutely. the most important thing in the world. But yeah. there's no depth to it because it's literally a manipulative... Oh, yeah, well, there's a book written about that, which is Is My Boss, boss 
the sociopath. <laughs> I sound like another book I should check out. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that you touched on was this thing about what they show interest in of others. Mm. And that is absolutely fascinating because I worked out what it was. Oh, now, tell me. Well, okay. So what we've got here is this hub network hidden in um, plain sight. So its biggest problem is security. Uh -huh. if, if it's hacked constantly by time wasters that don't reciprocate and feed information that's of value, the whole thing dies. Yeah, so every sense. single member of the hub structure and you are in a hub structure and I am in a hub structure, they're all slightly differently, but every single member recognizes there is a secret handshake, which is the security password. Mm. And the secret handshake is absolutely fascinating. And it goes like this. When a leech is trying to suck information out of an individual or the network, what they do invariably is they corner or get a meeting with or try and um, waylay the individual they're trying to connect with. And then they try to do something which totally gives them away. What they try to do is be interesting. They try to be interesting to the individual believing that they're selling themselves and being visible to that individual. What the individual actually does is what every single person on the planet does when someone behaves that way is shut them down and try and get rid of them. So think about the last time you met your buddies in, the, in a bar. Can you think about that? Yeah. Think about that scenario. You're late and your buddies are in the bar and they're all stood around chatting and you walk in late and you start to tell them, all of them, your mates, you start to tell them how clever you are, how <laughs> successful you've been, how big your house is, how nice your new car is, how wonderful your new partner is, and that they're, they're a sexual god. What would your buddies do? They just look at you and go, what? <laughs> just like, no, I'm not trying to, it's just like that would be what, such a what, weird what thing to want? do as well, wouldn't it? It's oh. just rude. It's yeah, it's just rude. rude. <laughs> well, that is what people try and do to get visibility and to connect with senior people and mavericks, senior mavericks in organizations. Uh, and it's totally the wrong thing to do. Do you the, think it's right, because it happens in a vacuum? Because it, no. like, it just sits No, I think own. a lot of it happens because they've been told how to do it. Uh, they've been taught how to do um, elevator pitches. And there's, there's books on how to sell yourself. And it's insane. You wouldn't it's do it. It's so good at knowing when someone's talking rubbish. You know, and ah, they have no, no, no time. No, they don't even get that far. They do <laughs> not get that far. The, the, seriously, the, the hub won't let them get that far. They won't even listen to what they're saying. What they'll do is they'll elegantly disconnect. And this oh. will have happened to you. I know it's happened to me, but it goes like this. You go to someone and you say, I've got this great idea. I've got this fantastic idea that's going to save the company a fortune and I just need you to listen because I need some of your resources. And they'll go, that's fascinating, Robin. That is a really fascinating thing you've just talked to me about, but I'm not focused on it, but I do know someone who is. I know that John in that department over there um, is working on exactly this subject. And I'm sure between you, you can come up with a really good presentation. And when you have, bring it back to me. Now, you go away from that meeting feeling energized. You go away from that meeting feeling that the individual cares. You go away from that meeting knowing that you can do the move, make, move your idea and project along one. But what did that actually, what actually happened? Does it not depend on the individual? Because I, no. I think, I think, I think, I think, no, no, I don't think it does. I think it's a gut of, reaction. Because I think. <clears throat> I think I've been in the situation where I've definitely done that. And yep. I don't want to talk, you know, I just don't have the time. They're a pain in the neck. 
you know, because as you said, because you've got a close hub network, even though it might have hundreds of people in it, you already know the reputation of that person has come towards you. So you know, yep. <laughs> you've made a decision. But other times it might be actually that is really good. But I think, actually, I think the probably the difference is <laughs> if it's an immediate response, you're probably not interested. But if you've listened and engaged actively and then you've directed them off, then you are interested, if you sort of mean. So what you did, what that individual did was connected you to another leech. <laughs> That's what they did. It was elegant. You didn't realize they'd done that. You still think they're wonderful. You still think they're approachable. But actually what they did was connected you to another leech. They don't care that that individual who did that. They don't care if you two go into a corner and suck your faces off of each other. They don't care. They have connected you to another leech and they've got rid of it. The I reason for it is yeah, that the individual who approached them tripped the trip, the uh, alarm that they didn't use the secret handshake. Ooh. What's the secret handshake? Tell me. It's being interested. And you alluded to it earlier. Mm -hmm. When you meet with a, a powerful individual or a senior individual or a maverick that's doing very successfully, you know they must be a hub. You know they must be highly connected. And what you're interested in is access to their network. But what you don't do is you don't try and hack it. What you do is you approach them and you show interest in them. You ask them about themselves. You ask them about their family. You ask them about their hobbies. You ask them about themselves. Why? Well, because, as you said, nobody wants a leash. And obviously, and obviously when you're in the description, what you've described there, when you're senior, you don't actually have a lot of time. So no, people need to, right. to give you a bullet, you know, in two minutes, tell me what you want, or even in a minute. Well, the, my favourite one, my favourite one is always, how are you? It's oh. always a good one to start with. And then the next question you ask is the one that opens the door. Because the next question you ask them about is their business. What problems are you having? How is your business going? Whatever you think might be something that they will. Now, the reason for it is, um, and I used to wag my microsoft blue badge around in the training course <laughs> but the, the reason for it is that nobody's got into this organization nobody got into this organization and nobody's in this organization if they're not really good at talking about themselves oh. and they are mavericks are the same they are brilliant at talking about themselves they're brilliant at telling people about what they're doing and how it's changing the world all you do is you tap that, get them to talk about themselves. That's the secret handshake. Because you know, you're not trying to sell them anything. You're trying to find information out about them. That's interesting you said that. I, I smiled when you said that because it made me think, oh, good, I'm doing networking properly. I'll put that as a little <laughs> tip for me because they are my top two questions. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> what kind of things are you working on right now? <laughs> Absolutely right. That's, oh, I'm that relieved the, now. <laughs> that's the secret handshake for hub networking. Absolutely it is. And it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with the person on the desk next to you or the queen. It doesn't matter. They're all people. Once you've got them talking about themselves, they are then hooked because... They have to do something. They have to do something to not be rude. And the thing they have to do is ask you the same question. How are you? What are you working on? They have to do it. It's kind of ingrained into us since we were three. <laughs> um, and the minute they do that, yeah. the minute they do that is your chance. And if you're smart and you've thought about it, then you can start presenting your brand and your value to the organization. Only then. <laughs> Don't do you it. You know, it's so it's it's so interesting listening to you because it's <laughs> just it just makes me think about all the ones, all the sort of networks that fail. It's like it completely shocks me sometimes. What you know that like you're talking to somebody 
and they've yep. made a decision that impacts another person, but they mm -hmm. have no interest on what that impact has on the other person. You know, yep. so it, and you and it fascinates me because it, even when you say, "Oh, I think you ought to give them a ring," you know, don't send an email, yeah, yeah. give them a ring because they really wanted to do this project, and then you just say no with no explanation, they're going to be a bit confused. And they're like, no, they'll get over it. And you're like, yeah, but because I, I guess I'm thinking about <laughs> that hub network. Do you know what I mean? Because, it, do, do you know what I mean? And so I'm thinking about how, not not really how it looks, but how people feel. And maybe think, using your technology, maybe I'm subconsciously thinking about maintaining the strength of the hub network. Yes. You know, not in a community but kind of like the greater good for everybody is a strong network that everybody can work. Absolutely it is. Even and if you they don't never know. Because other people don't necessarily know they're in your hub network compared to somebody else. No. And you never know when or if that individual may come back to you and need you may need them. You just don't know. Yeah. So what you don't do, that's why this elegant disconnect works, because they haven't alienated the individual. They just got rid of them. Um, and also, reciprocity works both ways. Yeah. If you are in a line of traffic and a car next to you is trying to pull in and he waves his fist at you, how, how amenable are you to letting them pull in in front of you? <laughs> well, I can see what well, I see the answer to that already. <laughs> yeah. Reciprocity works both ways. If you, if you, alienate someone if you make a decision and you don't explain to someone who it's going to affect they will never forget that oh i was thinking actually you talking that is it i'm just thinking now is it a case of utility networkers hitting against hub networkers so the utility oh. networks are like I want this, you need, you know, oh, I don't need you right now, Robin, so I don't care yep. if I, you know, set on yep. your foot, I'm not saying sorry or whatever. Yep. And I'm, and, and there's me like hub networking thinking, why would I want to, it just doesn't make any, it's like a, it's, it doesn't make any sense from any perspective to well, the, destroy the, the, a, a node in the network for ah, no apparent reason. Why for would no you apparent do benefit. Absolutely yeah, there's no right. apparent Not benefit a... to be to be like this. So why destroy this node? Well, there's another reason. Later? There's yeah. another very, very strong reason. If you think about how these networks are constructed, mm. okay, that lots of people are interconnected with lots of other people, but not always the same ones as you. Yeah. You have no idea if the person you've just shot at is connected to someone else that you may need exactly and if that individual is a strong member of someone else's hub network and they get the opportunity to tell them that you are um yeah i understand what he's asking for but my experience of him is this and <laughs> I have so that, is that, the most, <laughs> that is the most powerful most powerful thing Look, so you're in the market for a brand new car okay yeah. You've decided you want a new car. And down the road from you is a dealership. They're flogging this beautiful new car, exactly like you'd like. And what do you do? Do I go and talk to the salesman and I get the salesman to tell me how good it is? Well, he's going to do that, isn't he? So what most of us do, in fact, what all of us do is two things. We go out to the internet and we go out to our hubs. Mm. And we know that we've got two or three hubs in our in, in our network that have got relevant information about either cars or that car in particular. Oh, I know. John had one of those a couple of years back. I'll talk to him. I'll look on the web and I'll look at the reviews. But when you go to John and you go, what, what do you think? I'm thinking of buying the, the Uchi Kuchi 9000 with the, with the hybrid job. And he says... It's okay, you won't buy it. You will not buy it. Two reasons. One, he set all the alarms going in your head. Two, if you buy it and it goes wrong, you've got to deal with him. 
Mm. You know what's so interesting about that? Because I because that really triggered me because I had a car <laughs> dealership <laughs> scenario when when I was because when I was younger I had you know like it wasn't quite my first car but it wasn't like you know so it was a car <laughs> um, and I had to take it for service and I took it to literally the local garage which is like a three minute drive and mm-hmm. the price for this service <laughs> was so much. And I remember at the time going, this just does, all my alarms were going off, like this just doesn't mm-hmm. feel right. But I couldn't, do, I just couldn't do anything about it. So, I, so anyway, so then I talk, spoke to a mate afterwards and he said, where did you, where did you go? I was like, and he was like, but it's only, I phoned up and it was only supposed to be this much money. So I got the boyfriend at the time to phone up to do a service for the same car. And, he, and the difference was something like 200 pounds. It was huge, especially when I was young. Yeah. And then another, and I just thought, hmm. But every time anyone has ever said anything about that garage, I'm like, well. And, and like, they ripped, and then, they ripped me off. You can't trump. No, absolutely. And right. then I you went to, and the thing is, and then I went to buy a new car years later. Um, and I didn't go to that dealership. I went to like, I went something like 15 miles out my way to the same <laughs> dealership. I don't know if it was a Ford, whatever it was. And they said, oh, judging from where you live, why don't you not go to such a nice place? And I went, hmm. And he went, don't worry. Every woman I've ever spoke to have said they've mm-hmm. been ripped off with that. I thought, right, that's it. <laughs> I knew <Yeah>. it. <laughs> so that, that's my point. Reciprocity is a double-edged sword. And that's why the really skillful hubs, the socialized mavericks, recognize that you don't stab people because you never know. You never know what they're, who they're connected to who they're influencing, whose other networks they're in, you just don't know. The, other the thing fact that you don't know, the fact that you don't know is the power of this. Because if you approach it properly, if when you have attempt to connect, you connect with the secret handshake, if when you've connected, you present yourself the right way and present yourself from the your future benefit to the organization, and then you leave something fascinating happens that individual you now have to consider is a fiddler crab oh cool what on earth is that (laughs) well fiddler crabs um clean other fish what they do is they pick things out now what he was doing in or she was doing in that meeting with you was they were looking for things that were relevant to stuff they had in their head yeah They will pick out the bits that you talked about that clicked with relevance that's flowing in their head. This relevance that's flowing in their head is relevant information that's flowed in their hub network for up to five years. You don't know how long. Yeah. They'll go, oh, I know that so-and-so was looking for someone with that skill set. I wonder if they still are. And they will then launch packets of information that they've picked out of your information, rebundled, and they will launch it at individuals in their hub network. The reason being they reciprocate. They're adding value to their hub network. Valuable pieces of information flowing out of them based on the, inf- the, the conversation you had. It's totally random or appears to be, but it's immensely powerful because... First of all, you have no idea what they picked out, and you can't go back to them and ask. Mm. You can't. That, that conversation we had the other day, was there anything? You can't do that. You can start looking for the response, and the response is fascinating. Now, you remember that I said that this network has a security protocol, mm-hmm. and that the secret handshake when you meet someone is to be interested. But if somebody sent you a hub, a trusted hub that you trust, send you a piece of information about an individual you've never met and says they might be of relevance to you if you are still looking for someone who can do this, what they will do is they will contact you and they will use a mechanism to override all of the security, your security and theirs. 
and it's generally in the form of an email. It might be in the form of, of a, an IM or any other message. But in my experience, because we were email centric, it was always an email. Yeah. The email went like this. Dear so-and-so, i.e. the person you're trying to connect with. I was in a conversation with John, and that was the hub that I'd connected to. And he ind indicated you were blah, 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 blah. That link, that use of the last point you touched the, the network is the security override. He now does not have to go through the bother of trying to make a handshake with you. That's the handshake. <clears throat> and you now know something fascinating because you know what that bit, how that piece of information was taken out of the context you put it in, what your hub connection did with it, who they sent it to, and that that contact has come back to you because it's relevant to them. That's that so interesting. That is link, that link, that overriding security protocol, that connection is two things. It's confirmation to you that what you talked about was relevant to someone in the organization, and it came back to you as an opportunity. Mm. This is why there's a, a saying that goes on all the time, which is, yeah, but the best jobs never get advertised. Yeah. It's true. It is absolutely true because that opportunity is potentially a job for you. And whether you're one of six or whether you're one of one, it's an opportunity that you can go and talk to them about and, and, and present your brand to. And that is the, the massive, massive power of hub networks. And, but the hub network will work against you if you approach it the wrong way. True. That's how it works. And it's only forgiving up to a point. Oh, it's totally unforgiving if you get it wrong. Totally. And I've watched and seen. Um, there are people, especially in organizations like the one I was in, who rise through the organization at a massive trajectory. These are the antisocial mavericks. Mm -hmm. They behave just like the social ones. They're almost impossible to spot when they're coming up through the organization. But every point they move from, they leave devastation behind them. Yeah. They fail to deliver. They move on quick, more quickly than it was possible. They overspend on their project. They alienate all the people they were supposed to be managing. You, you name it, they're doing it. So the ones that you're promoting out of the problem because you can't have Absolutely it. right. Because what they're doing is they're selling themselves up, 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 up. And they're very, very good at it. But the smart organizations and the smart mavericks in the senior positions know exactly who they are and what they're doing. Oh. And the minute their utility doesn't suit, suddenly their car parking space is empty. That's the thing. Extreme Mavericks, so charming. So, you know, if, yeah. if you're on the right side of utility, they're extremely charming and everything else. And the, but the minute that they stop succeeding, all the harassment that people have put up, everything that the company's gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they've moved the victims, okay. they've done all this sort of stuff. But the minute so that they deliver, they can't deliver, they're like, right, you need to go. Absolutely right. All of the, all of the negative reciprocity comes flowing out the organisation. Oh, absolutely. And it is devastating, totally devastating. A lot of these, um, a lot of these recent reports uh, about bullying, about sexual harassment, about intimate touching, about unwanted touching, about blah, 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 blah. They come out. They absolutely come out when that individual misses a step. It's so true because the, the, the charm sustains them for a while but when the number of cases reaches a tipping point regardless of what that number is that's when it all happens it's like Absolutely you know what the right. risk to me to protect you is too mm -hmm. high now and Absolutely there's nothing right. else between us to connect to keep so you got to go no and we have never ever engaged at a personal level even though you've invited me round to your house to meet yeah. your lovely wife we never ever engaged i knew exactly what you were doing um but anyway, so that's how hub networks work. And that's why social mavericks 
create them and protect them and feed them and constantly are interacting 24 by 7 365 days a year they will be constantly thinking about how to maximize their relevance in those in those networks that is why when they get a problem to solve they can go to parts of the organization you'd never thought of and they can solve it you know, I, I, yeah, I went down to the, the shipping department and I had a chat with the guy on the forklift. And you go, what? <laughs> like, you know the guy on the forklift truck? Yeah, yeah, I play football with him. But <laughs> that's the thing go. that's really funny. But the only thing I would disagree maybe with you is that I don't think it's intentional. So I'm thinking about when I connect. To, I connect, you know, you have all these connections all over the place, but they're not done from a point of this may be useful later. No, no, they're it's not. More of a they're, case it of, is a natural you behavior. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's innate. You're right. It's, I think it's that nurturing of the hub network doesn't come from a may use it soon, but it comes from yeah. a genuine, how is everybody? Let me just do some checking in. You know, it's a like, genuine you know, interest in Genuine people. interest. It's Absolutely like, I don't right. want nothing. How are you? No. It's that bit like with the COVID thing, isn't it? Like, you just, you know, I went through, I, I just, took an hour one day, went through LinkedIn and contacted some people I haven't spoken to in over a year, just to see, I was like, I just checking in, how are you, do you need anything, you know, just because it's like, oh, I've not heard from this person for a long time, we just make yep. sure they're okay, and that was Absolutely. all it was. Yeah, and it is immensely, immensely powerful, it's quite time consuming, there are three, there are some rules um, which are in a book by uh, a physicist called Albert Laszlo Barabasi. Um, and the rules for hubs, in, mm -hmm. in, and this is about, um, um, it's about the, the mechanism, the mathematical mechanism of these networks. Okay. But what, what, it, what it says is that a hub has got three problems, time, relevance and connectivity mm. if if any of those three aren't nurtured and cared for the hub fails if they're difficult to connect to difficult to interact with they will fail if what they're doing falls out of relevance and they haven't kept their connections up and, and studied and monitored their relevance they will fail and if they burn all their time on the wrong things then they will fail this is why when you approach a hub they have not got the time if you are not relevant and if you are not relevant you behave like a leech and that's the trigger they don't even they don't even waste time if they can avoid it if they can quickly think of a way of disconnecting from the leech they will um, yeah. if you connect with them and behave like another hub the fourth thing about Barabasi's mathematics is hubs constantly seek out other hubs mm. and if you behave like a hub they will listen to you and the way you behave like a hub is you don't act like a leech you are interested in them in what they're doing and you don't sell yourself apart from when they ask you what you're doing and then you just tell them what you're doing it's a fascinating thing that you said <laughs> you said that this is innate and people are born like it i say that if you actually understand how it works and you actually understand what's going on you can do bits of it to your benefit now not yes, yeah. like the the not like the antisocial maverick but you can get benefit out of uh, connecting this network in this way you can get benefit by thinking about yourself differently you can get benefit by understanding what kind of role gives you the most energy and if you can get those things right even though you're not innately and naturally a, a networker like that you can still do that behavior you only have to do it 30 minutes a week yeah, it's true. and it will get you benefit. My favorite story was one of my consultants that I was coaching on this, who was very, very skeptical because most of them are because they're consultants. <laughs> and I used to give them an ex uh, uh, I used to give them a challenge. And the challenge when I finished coaching them was try it. 
pick someone in the organization who's not relevant to you, not connected to you, not not even in the part of the organization that you're interested in at all, a safe sandbox, and set up a meeting with them. Ask to meet them. Use an excuse like, you know, you're new into the organization and you're just trying to understand it. Trust me. Oh, they won't meet with me. They're too busy. Do it. They invariably always got a meeting. They invariably got a meeting for 15 or 20 minutes. If they use the technique of being interested, the meetings invariably overran. This individual came back to me and he said, I can't believe what happened. <laughs> Why? He said, well, I met with this individual who was a senior manager in so-and-so part of the business. Yeah. And he's bought my villa in Spain. <laughs> That's because he liked him. Yeah. And he, he was looking for a villa in Spain. Now, there's no way that this individual would have known that. No. But but, but that, what he'd done is he'd recently moved to this country from Spain and he had a, a home in Spain and he was trying to sell it. And it came out in the when the guy started asking him about himself, it came out and suddenly, oh, hang on. <laughs> and it's fascinating. If you watch people when they're meeting face to face, when that happens, they both lean in. Um, people do that on they Zoom calls on, as well. I've mm, noticed that. Yeah. You, you hit that relevance point. You don't know what it is. It might not be anything to do with your job. In his case, it was totally relevant to the individual's person. When it happened to me, uh, I, I'm a sailor. Right. I have a sailboat, and I had a sailboat at the time, which I'd sold. But I met with a very senior manager at, at Hewlett Packard when I was working there, and I was learning how this wave maker thing worked. And I was starting to coach people that I was managing on some of the aspects that I understood. But the bit about how you get to this relevance by not being a leech, I didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't enunciate it. But I was practicing. And I, I got bolder and bolder and met with more and more senior people. This individual was the head of our, um, um, word, of our email product at the time. And... When I got, to, I asked him about him. I asked him about what was going on in his business. He asked me about me, and I told him where I lived on the south coast. And he stopped and he said, "What's your hobby?" And I, oh, I said, "I, I say, well, where in the in the blah blah blah? Where do you keep your boat?" And, and off we went. Just off we went. And what it was, he bought a boat, and it was costing him an arm and a leg to keep it on uh, on the handle. And he was looking for cheaper places to keep his boat. <laughs> <laughs> But after that, I could approach him at any time I wanted. Yeah. But, and it's just incredible how it works. It is immensely powerful, but you've got to immerse yourself in it. You've got and, to understand it. Yeah, now, you have, you social can't... mavericks live and breathe it. They yeah. live and breathe it. You, you Other people yeah. do it's it all the time and don't realize it's ubiquitous. Yeah. It's, I, I think, I think it, it does fascinate me the way so many people only want to work from a utility standpoint yeah. and it just seems so short-sightedness it just seems so short-sighted to, to yeah. be in that way because it's like it's because what it's what it does for a mindset it proposes that you know as an individual exactly what you're going to need <laughs> at any one point in time and also you limit what you're prepared to give at any one Time. So what you are, if you're like that, is a user. <laughs> yeah, but and people don't at, see it like that because they. No, they no, they don't. No, but if you stand back and you understand how it, this is why I, I didn't upset people, but I was reasonably good at coaching people because I, I could use. Why are you behaving like a leech? What? Why? Why are you behaving like a user? What? What? I mean, well, you've just done this and you've just said, well, yeah. And when I talked to you, you said this and that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but. You're just using that individual. If you contribute to the hub network and are reciprocating value to the hub network, it gives you unbelievable value back. And your life is more fun. Disordinately too. valuable back. Yeah. You know what? I think maybe socialized mavericks do that innately because they're pathologically curious. They're just well, fascinated yeah. about with everything. So <clears throat> You know, I've met a new person. Tell me everything about you that I need to know. You know, it was quite interesting. I knew this person and I'd know, and we were close friends and I'd known that individual at the time for maybe 
five years or something. Anyway, somebody else came up to me and said, does that person, we were just chatting, got a brother or sister? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then they said, and they said, why don't you know your good friend? And I'm like, this is like uh-huh. business acquaintances. I'm like, it never came up. So I, ne- so I assumed it wasn't that important to that individual. Yeah. But I do know, I can tell you their hopes, their dreams, their passions, <laughs> where they are with all of those things, what they care yeah. about, what they don't care about. You know. So for me, I felt like I had a deep connection because I knew what was important to that individual. Yeah. Whereas the other person thought all of that stuff was irrelevant, but what uh, was important was how many siblings they had. And I was like, well, mm, uh-huh. okay. I mean, if it's really important, <laughs> they said, I've got two sisters or three sisters or four brothers or whatever. But the fact yeah. that in five years it never, never came up meant that it wasn't something so that they what, thought what was relevant to me at that time. What you're talking about there is another um, human trait, which is manners. And what, what, where you need to be very careful and where hubs are very, very good is they do not overstep the mark. They do not get intrusive because, again, if they do, people won't trust them. And yeah. what they are constantly doing is honing, building and growing trusted networks. They're on, on the lookout for hubs all the time to connect to hubs. But what they're actually going to do is invest in the ones that they trust the most. And if you get start questioning them, questioning them in an intrusive way, overly um, uh, interested in what they regard as personal, they won't trust you. Because it's, it's very interesting, because I went back to that individual and said, oh, yeah, by the way, have you got any brothers and sisters? <laughs> yeah. And they went, yeah, I've got this and this and this. And I said, why have we never discussed your brothers and sisters? And they said, it's never been relevant. And I thought, okay, yeah, exactly. I'll go with my instincts. Go, there was the word. There was the word. It's exactly relevant. what they said. It was never relevant in any of our conversations. So I thought, yeah. good. Because I felt because I felt really bad at the time. Because I thought, <laughs> yeah, they're my friends. And we're really close. And I have no idea about... I, I knew that they had children. And I knew they were married. But I didn't know about the other part. Because it never. it just never came up. It never came up. It's not relevant. And that's fine. The, it, because you're you're you have to maintain good manners while you're having these meetings and discussions, and you don't you do not and cannot get intrusive. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Look, so, I, um, go on. I was going to say this is probably a good place to stop. In so much that <laughs> we've had a whale of a time chatting, so I'm hoping you will come back and have another hour's worth conversation because this has been absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you. Well, now I've worked out how to work Zoom. Um, uh, uh, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's really great, Robert. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Robbie as much as I enjoyed having it. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally... If you would like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. Mm-hmm.